Hello, ISMB. So today I'm going to talk with you about large language models and how I think they can help with bioinformatics. Uh, but specifically, the big question of where does biomedical or biological knowledge actually come from? Uh, we can think of it as the result of repeated observations, uh, but really that's kind of a task in itself to, to learn from those observations and to automate that process. So how do we actually automate learning from literature, comparing findings, or even just integrating observations across studies, knowledge bases, and across entire fields and disciplines? So if the past few decades have taught us anything, it's that we need structured data, we need consistent data models, standards, and ontologies that can help with this process and help make our, our data more manageable and more uh, machine operable, uh, but they don't do the hard work of actually structuring the data for us. So how do we curate structured data from unstructured text? Uh, traditionally, this is the domain of human experts, which is a famously limited resource, particularly in terms of time. Uh, but we've also developed role-based extractors like the SEMEDDB project that offer fairly high precision with low recall, unfortunately, that can vary by domain and structure that you're actually trying to extract from data. Then we also have methods that are based on term enrichment or annotation enrichment, uh, where you're trying to find some kind of a correlation between the, the frequency of a particular term and some other factor, like a, a context or a topic. Uh, this unfortunately can sometimes be subject to publication bias, where some things are just studied more often. If you look at something like, uh, like TP53, that's certainly going to show up a lot more than, than some yet uh, uncharacterized gene. Uh, more recently, uh, there've been a number of applications of neural networks like LSTMs in natural language processing and specifically this problem of biomedical information extraction, uh, but they have often required really extensive labeled training data. And even then the kind of data that you're using may actually be overfit for your particular problem and may not represent the, the broader uh, variety available in biology and biomedicine. So most recently, we've seen the rise of language models like BERT uh, and GPT, which I'll talk more about shortly, uh, which bypass the problem of learning about language from scratch. You start with something that is trained on a broad collection of language and essentially understands what language should look like in practice. Now, many of these methods may still be very effective for some use cases, uh, but I'm gonna focus on the use case of how do we translate unstructured scientific text directly into an arbitrary knowledge schema. So these schemas might be complex and involve nested subclasses, and you may have some classes that are one particular type and other classes that are other types, and then you wanna know the relationships between them. So it gets to be pretty complex. Uh, and then let's take that a step further and say, we wanna to link to external unique identifiers. For example, we want all the proteins to link back to Uniprot. We want all of the, the taxons to link back to the N NCBI taxonomy database. Uh, so can large language models like OpenAI's GPT-3 or GPT-4, can they actually help with this task? Uh, well, there's a few things we need to consider before we, we begin answering that question. Uh, and one is this concept that uh, bigger models may not always be better. Uh, it's really task dependent. And in fact, if we look at uh, recent work with the Big Bench Language Technology Benchmark, they found that uh, about a, a third of the, the tasks in that, that benchmark, and there's more than 200 of them, uh, actually seems to um, be subject to, to the emergent behavior of large language models where they just suddenly get better. Uh, at some tasks when they reach a certain size. And that's that's a really valuable thing to be able to take advantage of uh, with large models, because it's not like they're just always steadily increasing in, in performance as they get bigger. It's like they, they really do uh, hit a point where they're just capable of, of new things. Uh, and that's, that's an interesting thing to be able to explore. Unfortunately, um, for many of these models that GPT-1's included, we're not entirely clear what the training data is. Uh, it may even include some kind of fictitious claims that we want to try to avoid. Uh, when we couple this with the idea that we are actually getting human-like performance on, on some tasks, even in biomedical applications, um, we need to be aware that this, this human-like performance is not actually coupled with any kind of human reasoning. Uh, and to make that a little bit more complicated, uh, our, our ability as humans to distinguish between human communication and the generated text that we get out of those models is, is sorely lacking. It, in many cases, it looks exactly the same. Uh, for example, we look at this uh, study by Levine et al, where they were 
actually trying to ascertain how good GPT-3 was at doing medical triage uh, based on uh, case descriptions. And when they talked to it about vaccines, in one instance, it came back with vaccines can cause death. Vaccines are not tested for safety or effectiveness, which is patently false. Uh, and an unfortunate thing to have uh, a model try to present you with or maybe convince you of. So this leads to this uh, other complication of hallucinations, where we need to remember that large language models are grounded in language, not fact. They are perfectly capable of inventing things that are patently false and trying to convince you that they, in fact, are true. So uh, to counter some of these, these issues, we developed this method called SPIRES, or Structured Prompt Interrogation and Recursive Extraction of Semantics. Uh, in short, that's information extraction that's grounded in reality. Uh, so in SPIRES, you start with some kind of text that you want to extract information from, and you couple it with a, a knowledge schema. And again, this can be one of these complex schemas with nested subclasses, where you actually want to link concepts back to some kind of external identifier. Uh, you pass both of these uh, as part of a structured prompt to a large language model, in this case, uh, GPT-3 or 4. You parse the resulting uh, response, ground, map, and normalize those with the ontology access kit, which is uh, publicly available. Uh, and then you get structured data out the other end that ideally has uh, all the, the capability of, of addressing your use cases. So this is currently available through the OntoGPT package. And if you scan that QR code over there, then you can find the program itself. So uh, in the broader sense, this means that that structured data can be extracted on MOS from large collections of unstructured text, uh, translated into uh, relationships that you would be able to integrate into knowledge graphs. Luckily, we also have some infrastructure to do that as part of the KG Hub project. So see kghub.org for more details about that. Uh, so you can combine this uh, structured extracted sets of relationships with things like ontologies that will be able to better contextualize the, those kind of relationships into a heterogeneous knowledge graph. Uh, so to get a little bit more specific, what Spires actually does is it works with a LinkML schema. And LinkML allows you to uh, use a pre-structured language to define the, the kinds of things that you uh, expect to uh, model in that, that schema. So what Spires does is it generates a prompt from that schema and the input text you get that prompt, a GPT or your other language model does the, the prompt completion. You get the completed prompt back from that that we essentially uh, call the, the raw completion. Uh, the um, individual text fragments in there are, are searched uh, to see if they can, they can be grounded to uh, the specific chosen uh, annotators that, that we call them. Uh, where possible, we can also translate the, the result to OWL and use that to do reasoning. If you're familiar with the uh, kind of reasoning that you can do over a nice ontology. So this is a, a quick example of what a LinkML schema actually looks like in practice before we, we pass it. Uh, obviously, this is the, the graphical, re graphical representation rather than the, the text. But in this case, you want to define uh, a kind of document that contains relationships between chemicals and disease. Uh, so in turn, those documents uh, can be defined by publication metadata. Those specific relationships between chemicals and diseases can be defined uh, based on a subject, of object, and a predicate, where the subject is chemical, object is disease, and the predicate is some kind of relationship between them. So um, I'm going to step away from chemicals for a second and, and talk about recipes, because it turns out uh, that this is a, a great example for, for doing information extraction. So if you uh, just go on online and find a, a nice recipe for Lyonnaise potatoes. Uh, then uh, you can point uh, onto GPT with the Spires method directly at this, and you get a result very much like what you have on the right here. Uh, now, this is actually a truncation of the, the total result that you get, but you can see right away that uh, based on our, our data schema that we've provided, uh, you get lists of, of ingredients uh, coupled with the, uh, the amounts uh, now, each of those ingredients are defined uh, based on the food ontology or food on, so they each have those nice unique IDs. Uh, the amounts are based on a, a given value if provided, as well as a unit from the units ontology, that's UO. Uh, so essentially you have an, uh, a completely structured ingredient list based on values. And in some cases, uh, the language model has had to do a little bit of inference and say things like, okay, well, the, the state of this, this item is, is chopped. Uh, or in uh, one of those cases, well, we actually have four onions. Onions aren't really a unit, 
uh, but our language model is uh, essentially intelligent enough to, to figure that out. Now we can also uh, go in and based on the same model, uh, try to say, okay, well, here's the, the set of actions uh, that needs to happen in the order that they, they need to happen. Uh, so we take those food ontology IDs and say, okay, well, in this case, we need to caramelize the onions uh, or we need to use our, our skillet in a uh, well, particular large oven proof skillet. Uh, now, in this case, we've categorized that as a food, unfortunately. So there are mistakes to be made sometimes. Uh, but some of this really just comes down to lack of a, a proper ontology for this particular thing. So if anyone wants to start a cooking actions ontology, then uh, I'd, I'd be very excited to see it. Now, of course, this works for biomedical documents as well. In this case, this is uh, a study about small cell lung cancer and therapies thereof. If we apply our uh, chemical disease uh, data schema to it, then right away we can extract, okay, we have a particular uh, set of, of actually two drugs that we know are used to treat a disease and we can look at that disease name back to a, a mesh ID. Um, in practice, if we actually go through the BioCreative 5 uh, CDR set, that's chemical to disease relations, uh, and see how well it does, it eh, will perform just slightly worse than the average F1 score uh, across all the participants in that initial challenge. Um, the big plus being that, well, this method doesn't require any additional training or, or fine tuning. It's all in the language model already. And that's uh, pretty convenient to have. Uh, now, does this work on uh, more biological or ecological papers as well? And the short answer is absolutely. Uh, so in this case, we have a, a paper uh, about cellulose patterning in, in seeds, and our particular uh, plant of interest here is Arabidopsis as a very common model organism, and so we can extract that as part of our model, but it also extracts the genes, uh, the relationships between genes and organisms in case you have uh, multiple different organisms in a, a given input text. Uh, but then it can go in and extract things like the uh, particular activities, gene functions, and cellular processes. Uh, and in this case, it's aligned with them to Go terms wherever it can. Uh, in some cases, we don't have a matching Go term, and sometimes that highlights, well, maybe that's a uh, something that Go is just lacking, or maybe this is just a very complicated kind of activity that, uh, again, our LLM is capable of extracting for us, and maybe we're still interested in. Uh, and so it goes directly into those uh, extracted bits. Um, so I'm not going to spend too long on this, but if you want to go ahead and try it yourself, uh, now this is the recorded version. So feel free to pause your presentation here and click on that link or scan that QR code and you yourself can go and try Spires through the OntoGPT package. Uh, now OntoGPT will happily download all the necessary ontologies that are defined in a given, uh, given data schema. Uh, and you can even create your own data schemas for your own use cases. Uh, so I'll close out by mentioning we do have a, a preprint out on this that's readable. We have a, um, uh, with the full description of the Spires method. Um, next steps on, on this are to uh, essentially automate the process of knowledge graph assembly. Uh, we wanna be able to extract uh, relations directly from the literature, integrate them with those defined in other knowledge bases and ontologies, um, and essentially use those to identify predicted relationships. Uh, this is great because you get the best of both worlds. You get the uh, unstructured, essentially more noisy relationships that you'd find in uh, biological and biomedical text, along with the, the very structured relationships and the curation that you get from knowledge bases and ontologies. Uh, and you can, you can learn from both of them, uh, which is great both if you want to be able to do uh, additional curation in those knowledge bases or in the ontologies, uh, but also if you're trying to combine a, a whole set or an entire field's worth of, of literature uh, and kind of contextualize the, um, the findings that they get. This is great if you're working across domains as well, uh, because in a particular domain, a, a certain concept or even a, a gene or protein name may be referred to using a, a completely different uh, set of language in, in one domain versus another. So the language model and the grounding can help to do a bit of the disambiguation and find some, some consistency uh, across, across domains and across literature. Uh, now, there are still some limitations of, of using this method. Uh, for now, we are largely dependent on the, uh, the GBT models available through OpenAI, and we directly use their, their API. Uh, that doesn't work for everything. Uh, we don't necessarily always want to, to send all of our information directly to a, a foreign API. Uh, 
to a, a small sub, sub, subset of models with training data that we're not entirely clear on. Um, and we also want to avoid potential hallucinations in there. So um, what we're doing now is, is adding more uh, ability to use open models uh, that we can have greater control over and greater knowledge of the, the training data that went into them. Uh, we also want to try to improve some of the mappings that we get between identifiers. Uh, and uh, we've added some additional functionality in a method that we call spin doctor uh, for gene enrichment analysis in here. Uh, so the, the overall goal here is to do some, some broad literature extraction. Uh, in some cases, this can be from full text, like Daddy, from PubMed Central full text. Share my log. Mm -hmm. Daddy, share my log. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for you, the audience, uh, for everyone in my team uh, in the Berkeley Bioinformatics Open Source Projects group at uh, the um, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, as well as everyone on the uh, the team for the Monarch Initiative. They're, they're listed here, and apologies if I've missed anyone. Uh, my email can be found here, along with my GitHub. Uh, I'm on Mastodon at the Fetty Science Instance. Uh, and again, please scan that QR code if you'd like to try out AutoGPT and Spires for yourself. <laughs>